to uh, the neighborhood house, the Wildstone Center. And um, thank you very much. Uh, this is our third annual uh, uh, Latino Education Achievement Gap Summit. And um, one thing that, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, and one thing that remains constant is always on a beautiful day. So uh, last year was the same type of weather. But uh, you know what I, I, I like about that? It, it, it proves that you know, when people are concerned, when they're interested, when they see that uh, this is this is really a crisis here, this achievement, and they come to the show up. So I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for making this important to be here. And uh, also we want to thank uh, we want to thank our sponsors uh, for this uh, this program here and for La Familia Expo that's taking place uh, shortly at right, right at eleven o'clock, eleven in the morning. We we switch over there. We've got a wonderful expo that uh, we might mention during the program. But uh, our our sponsor is the Minnesota Twins, uh, Telemundo Minnesota, La Raza Radio, a U.S. Bank. Uh, Latino American Today and uh, two new sponsors, uh, Oak Opportunity for All Kids, a uh, brand new organization here that's doing wonderful work. And then uh, another new sponsor for us, Buffalo Wild Wings is a sponsor. Yeah, Buffalo Wild Wings. And, uh, they're head of uh, a diversity and uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, we'll be here on one of our panels. So again, a, a thanks to all our sponsors. Uh, they've been wonderful with us. And uh, of course, uh, as, we, as we move along through this program today, we do have a wonderful program. I was just uh, caught, up, uh, caught in the, uh, thought about this quote that was in the uh, July uh, 28th Pioneer Press. And it was, a, it was a, about our test scores. It was a little change uh, over state test scores. And uh, I was just caught off guard about this uh, statement. Uh, uh, after another round of disappointing standardized test results, Education Commissioner Brenda Casillas said the state may never boost the academic performance of students of color without first addressing outside factors that hold children back in school. Well, that's the challenge. And, uh, but, but I think we have to work closer together also. Um, the article went on to say, despite ambitious goals and targeted interventions in low-income, low-scoring schools, the state's public schools in recent years have made virtually no progress on closing the achievement gap in students of color. Now, I know there's been progress. I, I, I think this, this is a generalizing all the work that a lot of you do. But it remains that, that the achievement gap is, is here. Uh, that, that uh, we have much work to do. And that's what this uh, event is about. Um, you know, being candid, be looking at solutions, uh, hoping that, uh, that in the end, uh, some of these solutions are, are um, given life and uh, so that we can uh, come here year after year and we'll see the success uh, that, uh, that we, we want so desperately for our kids. Now, oh, there's a couple of students here. I mean, of course, Rob Hans, we're going to be, we're going to be talking about Almas. It's a great program. But uh, Ralphie, Ralph, uh, Ralph, uh, Ralph is from, Ralph, is he here? Uh, well, he's with Hogan as a salute. They're actually doing a live broadcast on uh, radio. So let's mention before we start the program, SPNN, St. Paul Neighbor Network, is with us. We video the, uh, the event today. And then we have John. And then we have a, a Radio Ray, a, a, I'm sorry, a, a, a La Rasa Radio. La Rasa Radio is right across the hall. They're doing a live program. Here's the guys from La Rasa Radio. Thanks, fellas. And at 9, at nine to 10, they'll be doing their live uh, broadcast. And they have a new program, Graduating Latinos. That's the new program they have. It's an hour. Um, they do the program an hour every Saturday. They're looking for speakers. They're looking for topics. They're looking for um, uh, uh, programs they can talk about and, and interviews and that type of thing. And I'm really proud that Arasa uh, took that first step into having a, a program about education. It really shows that by their sponsorship and also by having a, a program on Saturday. So let's go ahead with our, with our first uh, presentation. And I'm going to introduce uh, Chaz Anderson. 
uh, from uh, uh, Oak Opportunities for All Kids, and she's going to introduce the panel. So let's have a hand uh, for Chaz Anderson. Thank you. Gracias. Buenos dias. Thank you for joining us on this early and beautiful Saturday morning. It's going to be quite a glorious weekend in Minnesota. Um, my name is Chaz Anderson, and I'm the Executive Director of Opportunity for All Kids. Opportunity for All Kids, or OAK as we call ourselves, is a statewide advocacy organization focused on bringing greater educational choices to children and families across Minnesota. I will make a few remarks, and then we will head to our first panel today, which I'm pretty excited to have uh, Sarah and Mitch with us here today. <coughs> Recently, the Minnesota Department of Education released its test scores for the 2015-16 school year. In front of the results were quite sobering for our disadvantaged students. We'll dive into the numbers in a few minutes, but we did not make much progress on the achievement gap for Latino or African American students. Unfortunately, our achievement gap has persisted for decades, which has led to greater income inequality in our state and actually also workforce shortages. But, you know, we're not also just about lamenting about the problem. Our panel is going to talk about solutions, and we're also going to talk about what we can do for families and our disadvantaged children, and bring up and, and address these issues of income inequality and workforce shortages, and make sure we have a productive workforce. So I'm honored today to present our panelists and dive into this important issue. Uh, we'll start with introductory comments from our panelists, and then we'll go into a PowerPoint and talk about our, you know, talk about the achievement gap, talk about solutions, and then we'll ask, we'll allow the audience to ask, ask some questions of the panelists. I'm very honored to introduce the panelists. I've known both of them for quite some time, and just really um, honored to work with them at, at day to day on, on several different topics, but. The first panelist is Mitch Perlstein. He's the founder and president of the Center of the American Experiment. Mitch has a long history in Minnesota leading, advocating, and supporting education reform and choice in education. In 1997, Mitch worked with Governor Carlson to shepherd the last major education choice legislation into law, which was the expansion of individual tax credits for low-income families. Mitch also served uh, in the Governor Hui administration and also served in the U.S. Department of Education as an official under President Reagan and the first President Bush, President H.W. Bush. Sarah Walker is a senior advisor to, uh, for Students for Education Reform and well known for her work in education reform and criminal justice reform. Sarah has been working as legislative counsel and advocate of the Capitol for the past five years on these issues. And previous to her work, she was an executive director at 180 Degrees. So with that, I'd like to have our panelists come up. And we will be So we'll go to the PowerPoint presentation uh, for our panel. We'll first start out, I'm going to have Mitch and Sarah give some introductory remarks, and then we will dive into the PowerPoint and go to the audience questions. So with that, Thank you. Gracias. Morning. <laughs> I have never spent a day in my life as a student. As a student. Is this on? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful opening, actually. <laughs> I've never spent a day in my life as a student in a private school. I'm exclusively the product of public school back in New York and in Minnesota. But that doesn't mean I don't recognize that for many kids, many kids and many families, it just might work out better if they went to school. In a private school, it just might be better for them. I can tell you that um, we were just talking about such things. Uh, my 25th wedding anniversary is in October. It's my second marriage. 
It's my wife's second marriage. I used to say that I was in my second and last marriage, but Diane didn't like the locution, so I'm in my second and ultimate marriage. <laughs> but my three stepsons, who are now old, they're all in their 40s, if you go back to when they were kids, and their mother, my now wife, was going through a very difficult divorce, my stepsons were not doing particularly well. They were in Dinah High School and other schools in Edina. And the decision was made, not that there was very much money left in the family, but somehow they found the money to send the boys, one to Benil and two to Holy Angels, thinking that the structure there just might work better for them. And it did. For them, that was the right choice. For others, it would not have been. So I'm of the mind, if we are to assure that all kids have as much opportunity as possible, for many of them, it means going to a private school. There's just something special for them that works. And we have to find ways, we have to pass bills, we have to work uh, pursuing what old kids pursuing to make it possible for more people, for more families, to have the opportunity that my stepkids had a long time ago. Thanks. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, and thank you for being here today. Um, I'm honored and humbled to, humble to be on this panel with two of our state's leading education experts, I would argue. Um, I am far um, greener on this issue than either of them are, and I also came to the issue of education reform in, I think, probably a different manner. Many people have come to education reform focusing primarily on the K-12 education system, and my history of advocacy and work at the Capitol really stems from work on criminal justice. However, probably most of you have heard the statistic that, um, the statistics about education, um, and one of the things that we know is that we actually forecast our prison population based on third grade reading scores. And what you realize about working in criminal justice is that education is one of the leading drivers of whether or not you end up participating in the criminal justice system in some form. And in fact, recent research has shown that the entire growth of the prison population comes from people of color, who, male men of color who do not have high school educations. And when you continue to look at the dramatic statistics, the failure of progress, what I hope and would like to bring to this conversation is something that I think has taken a long time in criminal justice reform. Reform. Not just me. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, is um, one of the things I hope to bring in the conversation is right now I feel like we're in an intractable conversation where both sides have totally dug in on certain perspectives. And I really think that we need fresh perspectives, but a lot of that involves having more participation from, I think, parents. And I think a lot of parents don't know where they can enter the conversation because it's so often dichotomized between reformers and the unions, and there has to be some middle ground in that conversation. Um, the last thing I'll just say briefly is that, you know, I have been very fortunate to work for our, um, Students for Education Reform. It's an amazing organization that focuses on, um, it, it helps students who are at the college age become education reformers. So I get to work with all these amazing young people who are new to the, new to, um, the workforce, and they get to talk about their experience. And one of the major issues we're working on is the fact that the majority, the majority of African American students and um, an almost majority of Latino students are graduating and are still needing a tremendous amount of remedial education, which should point to some major problem within our education system. Thank you, Mitch and Sarah. So we'll go to this, uh, the next slide and then the slide after that. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about, we'll just go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the statistics, and some of this is new, just released a couple of weeks ago. But in Minnesota, I found this really astonishing um, when I worked at the Department of Education, um, you know, what these numbers actually looked like. Um, 
you know, Minnesota, you know, we like to think of ourselves sort of as above average, and then when you see these statistics, you it kind of makes you, you know, your heart drop, basically. Um, you know, our graduation rates for black students is at 51%, and the national average is 69%. I would say the national average is not good enough either, um, but we're, we're actually ranked dead last in graduation rates for black and African-American students. Um, our four-year graduation rate for Latino students isn't much better. It's 53%. The national average is 73 um, So those are some statistics that Sarah talked about. You know, those are drivers and other services that are needed. Uh, that we all pay for, and they have dire consequences for our society. Um, next slide. Um, just a couple weeks ago, the Minnesota Department of Education released uh, graduation, or not just graduation rates, but also um, what's called the MCAs, which is the Minnesota Statewide Assessments, um, taken grades three through eight and in high school on reading, math, and science. And um, what it found for African American students in grades three through eight, um, 31% were proficient in math compared to 68% for white students. So that's that's pretty stark. In reading, 35% um, were uh, proficient, while 68% were proficient for white students. So you can see the gaps are pretty wide. For Latino students, not much better. Um, about 36% were proficient in math, um, and then you know 38% in reading. So. Those are some some dire numbers, and if you you know that's the averages of grades three through eight. And if you take a look at that, it's probably higher, a little bit higher in grade three, and then and then probably falls uh, drops precipitously in, in later grades. But I want to ask our panel, you know, after hearing and seeing that, you know, as leaders in the education reform movement, I'd like to know your thoughts for what parents, advocates, policymakers here. I do want to mention we do have State Senator Chuck Weir who is in the audience who's the chair of the Senate Education Committee. I appreciate you joining us. Um, and what they must undertake to close the achievement gap and raise a student achievement for minority and underprivileged children in Minnesota. So I'll start with Mitch and then we'll go to Sarah. Well, the first thing, be real blunt. Families have to be stronger. Parents have to be more attentive to what their kids are doing or not doing. But in terms of policy, I could make an argument that uh, we have tried in this country and in the state really, really hard for at least 50 years to go back to the war on poverty. And we make some progress here and there, but obviously not enough. And I'm not just talking about kids of color, I'm also talking about white kids who, in the United States, don't compare real well to kids around the world. We have to do better. But spending money is not the way to do it, because we spend more money all the time. And I can put together a list of all the reforms that we have attempted to pursue in K-12 education, again, over the last 50 years. There are pages of them, but obviously they're not working as well as we need them to work. One thing we have not done in the state of Minnesota is to give enough parents the opportunity, if they so choose, to send their kids to a private school, which just might work better for them. When I say a private school, we've got private and religious schools. I'm not going to argue that's going to make everything truly wonderful, will not. But for many kids, it will make a measurable difference. And that's a good place to start. Um, well, in terms of beginning to move education reform at the Capitol, I mentioned earlier that one of the first things is, is I do think we need more parent participation and testimony and to go meet with their legislators. And they need to have those avenues to have their voices heard because I really do believe now um, it's largely being controlled by institutional forces. And a lot of the parents who I think would like some choice in their child's education opportunities are currently not able to make, make those decisions based on economic means. And I think that, like Mitch, I'm a product of public school, but and I was fortunate to go to a 
good public school, and I was blessed with parents who privileged education in my life. But the reality is, is when I went, I went, came here to go to Carleton, I was one of the only kids in that entire school who was not the product of private school. And quite frankly, I was significantly behind the other students when I first came to Carleton. Um, I was able to catch up because of a strong foundation, but I think right now that is lacking. I would also just say that I, when I was reading, um, doing some reading recently about school choice, you can look at countries like Sweden, and one of the things that was most interesting to me is while their outcomes might not exactly mirror um, programs in Minnesota, what their research has shown, and they have a nationwide choice program, is that the primary beneficiaries of choice programs are in fact immigrants and people with English as a second language. And so I think we need to start engaging communities of color and um, then one other reform that I think is possible we should be considering has to do with concurrent enrollment. And right now our system of public education, in my opinion, privileges those people who are already advantaged within the public education system. So students who are have concurrent enrollment um, should we should be offering a remedial education for those students who need it at that level as well. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Go to the next slide. Oh, one more slide. All right, great. Um, what I want to talk about, which I find interesting, is, is talk about education choice. And education choice is the full spectrum. It's not just about private schools, but also about having public school choice options, charter schools, and private schools. And, and what we wanted to do um, is take a deep dive into, you know, what's the support for education choice in Minnesota? and take a look at some of those trends. And so in April 2015, a statewide scientific survey was conducted by the Friedman Foundation. And what the, the survey results were pretty interesting. Um, you know, the survey found, we'll go into these a little deeper, but found that uh, Minnesota strongly support private schools and give private schools high marks. Education choice was widely supported by all demographic groups, but strongly supported by parents, African Americans, and Latinos in Minnesota. Um, and the, what I thought was interesting in the last bullet point is that parents who wanted access to private schools weren't wanting that access, did not list reasons such as religious reasons for wanting to send their child to a private school, but actually were wanting to send them to have access to better schools, more freedom, flexibility, and really listed educational outcomes in those reasons. So the next slide is just, we'll kind of dive into the support for education choice and you know who is supporting it. Now, the good news is that there's pretty wide support for education choice, but what really matters is intensity of the support. Um, people support lots of issues, but whether they feel intense about it is the important factor in um, engagement and how issues move forward. So as you can see, amongst political parties, Republicans support choice the, the, by far wider margin, but still, it's Republican 74% support, Democrats 62%, Independents 60%. So it's pretty wide support amongst all uh, groups of voters. Um, amongst age, if you look at age, actually young voters are very strongly supportive, probably no surprise given they grew up in having choice in everything and the internet and the age and that you can order anything you want at any time, so um, choice is probably a, a very uh, constant, you know, concept to them in day-to-day -day life. Um, so young voters, 76%, middle age, 69%, older voters, 56%. If you look at income, Actually, low income has the strongest support for educational choice, and you see it goes low, middle, income, to high. Now, this is what I found most interesting if you look at, at racial um, support. Um, amongst the black or African-American community, 78% support, that's very strong. The intensity is just what I talked about, is really when you look at groups, how intense do they support an issue. It was plus 45, which is a pretty strong intense intensity. Latino voters, I, I saw that 98 to 2, were like, who, 98%, wow, agreement on the subject, that's pretty strong. But as you can see, the intensity is about the same as for African Americans. So while the support is a little bit higher, the intensity is about the same. Now, if you look at white voters, that's actually the lowest support for education choice. And actually, it's a pretty low intensity, it's a plus 14. Um, so as you can see, there's wide support amongst the whites, but the intensity is not as strong as African Americans and Latinos. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. You know, another thing we looked at, I talked about it's basically, is, you know, how do Minnesota parade our schools? And Should I ask for that jump in for a second? Absolutely. Uh, I think it was about 65% of 
of the people in the state of Minnesota in this survey, which was an absolutely straight arrow, professional, unbiased survey, about 65% supported the kind of choice that we're talking about. People might say, well, that seems kind of high. Well, if you go back to the early 90s, Center of the American Experiment invested real money, <laughs> it was real money, uh, to do an absolutely, again, first rate objective survey in the state on various issues. And the percentage of people supporting school choice, including private schools, was about 65 percent. Jump ahead a couple of years to 1997, and Chaz talked about the campaign then that Governor Carlson led to get tax credits for certain educational expenses, and I was involved with that along with many others. And we commissioned a survey, again, an absolutely straight arrow survey. About 65 percent of the people in the state of Minnesota came out for this kind of choice. So this is not a minority position. It's a majority position in terms of people throughout the state in, in support. And when we talk about intensity, it is a good thing that a lot of people are intensely in favor. The problem is that those who are opposed tend to be more intense. So we'll go to the next slide. Just uh, I'll go through these uh, relatively quickly. But you know, we asked um, Minnesotans to grade their schools: private, charter, public. Um, actually, you know, private schools, high grades, eighty plus percent, gave it an A or B. Um, and um, actually, the public school, if you look at the Minnesota versus Americans, and Minnesotans rate their public schools higher than Americans generally do. Um, and then you'll see what the charter schools looks like right there. So next slide. Um, we also asked, you know, if you if, if financial and access barriers were not were not a consideration, meaning um, you didn't have to worry about family budget issues, you had a school, private school close by. A lot of times, private schools are just not accessible uh, geography wise. Um, would you consider, not what you sent, but would you consider sending your child to a private school? If you look at the actual results, about 85% of Minnesota students attend a public school, 8% attend uh, a private school, and 36% said, I would consider sending my child to a private school if financial and access barriers were not in existence. So, as you can see, there's a, a, a market there for parents who might consider that option if they had it. Uh, next slide. So given that, and this is a question for the panelists, um, given that, you know, as we saw the wide support for education choice, particularly among uh, minority communities and the intensity of those communities, what are your thoughts, and I'm going to start with Sarah first, on engaging communities um, uh, with, who have that intensity for support, engaging those communities uh, to make those choices a uh, reality? Um, well, I think that, first of all, community engagement is a long and ongoing process. Um, but I think one of the first things we need to do is have our um, communities of color being more participatory, not just at the Capitol, but also in the selection of school board members. They need to be participating um, and showing up. And I think we can just look to the most recent example of St. Paul, where I feel um, my perception is, is that regardless of what you think of um, Valeria Silva and her performance, the reality is, is that we keep on um, hiring high-profile people of color to run these positions, and they encounter institutional challenges. Um, and so I don't know if we can just look to the leadership as the single problem. I also think that some parents need to directly engage in the education unions because I feel like where we are right now is an impasse, but it's not acceptable for, in my opinion, any one group to not offer alternatives when the problem is so dire. And what's interesting to me about the intensity level, and also unfortunate, is that you see the high, you see a much higher intensity level among African Americans in the Latino community, and not the Caucasian community. And I believe that's simply because the Caucasian community is performing much better, and those and those results mirror their impact or their test scores and their achievement levels. And you see the vice versa with the Latino and African American community. So I think it's time for lawmakers and the education union to directly sit down and communicate with the education union about reforms that might be possible. And I think choice needs to be one of the one of the perspectives that are on the table. I've been involved in school choice activities in Minnesota ever since I got back from Washington in 1990. So that was 26 years ago. By the way, I, I moved out here 
42 years ago. I've been here ever since for a couple of years in Washington for the sin I must have committed at, at some point. Uh, and throughout the last number of decades, uh, the school choice organizations I've been involved with, and there have been several, we have been overwhelmingly white. I mean, overwhelmingly white. We haven't tried to make it that way, make an argument we haven't reached out well enough, but we have reached out. And one of the answers to Chaz's question, what do we need to do, people like me and people with whom I work, face to face. We have to be face to face with folks we're seeking to work with. We've done this sometimes very well, other times not so well. 1997, we did it great. We had a wonderful executive director of the school choice organization at the time. Some of you may know Kristen Rockman, and she made certain that every Sunday morning she was at a different church someplace around town. So we need to do better, but we also have to recognize, I'm going to be real blunt here, that for many people of color to support positions that we're talking about here, meaning choice that includes private schools, that will not necessarily make them the favorites of union leadership or DFL leadership. I'm trying to stay as far away from partisan issues as possible, but we have to recognize that it is very difficult for many people of color to be involved in these issues without inviting the support of uh, their colleagues. Thank you, Mitch and Sarah. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, one of the items that was almost, you know, almost a reality this legislative session and will absolutely probably be on the agenda for next session is something called Opportunity Scholarships, which is um, considered sort of the next generation of choice in Minnesota. Um, just a little briefer on what that is. Okay, just a little briefer on what that is and, and um, the support for Opportunity Scholarships. So what that legislation would do is provide individuals and corporations with the state tax credit to donate to a nonprofit, which is a student tuition organization. And then those organizations would give non-award uh, scholarships to low and middle income families to attend private or independent K-12 schools. About 22 states, including our neighboring states of South Dakota and Iowa, have such law. And um, if you go to the next slide, we did take a look at, you know, is there support for opportunity scholarships or the scholarship tax credit program? And you know, there's pretty wide support uh, for opportunity scholarships. One of the things that we did in the survey was that we took a, a significantly large sample of uh, the Twin Cities as a separate sample, thinking that you know maybe people in Minneapolis and St. Paul think differently than the rest of the state on, on uh, education choice. And to our maybe surprise, and maybe it's not a surprise, they really don't. I mean, we are pretty much one state on this issue. Um, and as you can see, there's actually a little bit more support in the Twin Cities than the rest of the state, but you'll see pretty strong support, overall statewide support is about 65%. Um, next slide. So I, we thought to, you know, since this uh, program's in 22 states, you know, how do Americans versus Minnesotans feel? We pulled this question, exact questions from polls and polls throughout uh, the country and a national survey and found pretty much Minnesotans and Americans feel the same way. Um, next slide. So that uh, I want to ask our panelists, because both of them are legislative experts at the Capitol, Sarah in particular. Um, given that the next legislative session is a budget cycle, so next year they will set the two-year budget, you know, what do you think the strategic and tactical activities uh, must fall in place in order to realize passage of, sim of this legislation or similar legislation when the legislature completes its work next May? Um, well, I mean, the first thing I think is one trying to get achieve bipartisan support in both the House and the Senate. I think we need to move away from bipartisan conversations. But the other thing is, is you know, what's so striking to me when I um, am watching the PowerPoint is just how I don't, you know, it's hard for me to understand the level of opposition to tax credits because simply they're scholarships which have been used in some form or another to for students with low income to access private education. And so rewarding individuals who want to make the choice um, for their children just seems 
um, it, it seems like it shouldn't be that controversial. The other thing is, is I still do think you need to you need to re-emphasize that this conversation doesn't have to be a dichotomized battle between the unions and public education versus private schools. The two have coexisted for a long period of time and can continue to, and one shouldn't jeopardize the other. And I think we really need to emphasize that point and that the two can coexist and be mutually supportive. I'm with Sarah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So what I'd like to do is take some questions from the audience, and I'd like to have Rick's help with that, because um, I know that we'll need the mic, and he'll need to he'll need to play a role here in the. So um, oh, we have a question over there. All right. So um, please uh, feel free to ask your question if you have a question for a specific panelist. I uh, just mentioned that as well. Okay. Um, I'm not going to be as uh, I'm going to be more blunt than Mitch on the political side of this, and I'm glad we have a representative that sits on a relevant committee with the state. Uh, I think this problem has proven itself to absolutely be a political problem. Uh, the the Education Minnesota Labor Union that, are, that represents the teachers in Minnesota is one of the largest financiers of the DFL uh, and of a governor, uh, this current governor that's sitting in the uh, in the uh, governor's office. And, you know, Catherine, you mentioned institutional challenges. I think it's institutional conflicts of interest. The unions are the problem in that, uh, particularly on the DFL side, there's more of an appetite to have a discussion about labor wages in this state than there is to have a discussion about these, this education gap with minorities. And that is part of the problem. And I think there is an absolute conflict of interest with the DFL and Education Minnesota because we're, ra we're raising the pay of these public school teachers seven to eight percent every time contracts are ratified. And we have the, pub the uh, school boards, the city councils, the mayors, the county commissioners, all controlled by the DFL, basically, for the most part, here in Hennepin County and St. Paul. So, you know, you can draw whatever correlations you want, but you know, we have a, we have a son that's in uh, Benilde St. Margaret, $14,000 a year, they have a 92% graduation rate. And you hear from the DFL that this is a money problem, yet we spend $21,000 a year on public schools in, in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know what the representative's agenda and plan is to address this problem, because part of the problem is, is that the unions are financing the DFL, and until that stops and you change the agenda, this problem is going to continue as far as I'm concerned. And I do want to thank Rick Aguilar for bringing this. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, to address the issue. Okay, well, we're looking for questions. Why not? Uh, thanks, Andy. But, uh, okay. I think you made the case very well. <laughs> well, thank you for hosting us. Uh, um, I do have a question, of course, I'd like to uh, make a couple of statements. I personally believe in choice for our parents. I have worked in private and public schools. I run Shalak St. Mary's, a private school, in a high school in the city of Minnesota. So I won't tell you that I have the insights to vote. That's why I say I do believe um, in choice for parents. However, um, one thing that I have to do with both private schools is that they do make a choice of which schools they select to that they're going to add into their school. Public schools, we admit everyone. I believe that public schools are great schools, but it depends who runs the schools. As an administrator, we have to, uh, we really have to focus on students. That must be a priority. I will tell you, Roberto has a great program. I have a great program. He's my, he's my brother-in-law. We talk a lot. We are family. <laughs> so we care about kids. So that is really who's leading the school and what is our priority. We must place the students at the center of everything. It doesn't matter which school you go to. We have great kids in Minnesota. We have intelligent students. Um, as a record, graduation rate, sleep in public school, 94 to 100 percent. Shout out St. Mary's, 98 to 100 percent. I run those schools. So both have been very good. Now, when we take a look at um, you know, the, the question I just asked before, we talk about vouchers. How are, we, how are we going to assure that every private school we take every student? The private school in the city of Minnesota. They do not take students with EMs or special education. So when I run the school, at the end, I invited them to come over to the public school because I was, a, I was offering advanced placement, college in the schools, 
articulation of the clinical colleges, they send me 50 kids. I collected the ADM for one hour for those students while they charted their, their full tuition. It was a worthy situation. I was offered to, I was able to offer the AP courses at the public school because I had more students. I could not offer it for two or three. With the kids from the private, from the private school that I lost them over, I was able to offer them. But they did not take every student. Neither did Sharak Signalis. I was an administrator. I was part of their selection. One of them, I appreciate the comment and the, uh, and the passion. But one of the problems in school choice debates always one where to focus on Minnesota. People, when they think of private schools, immediately think of Shattuck, St. Mary's, Blake, Breck, St. Paul Academy. And they know that tuition rates are very high there. And they know that everybody who applies doesn't get in. But there are hundreds, hundreds of private schools in the state of Minnesota, much smaller, where tuition rates are much lower, particularly for elementary school kids. Schools that truly do take everybody. So there's only a small slice of private schools in the state of Minnesota that are really selective in who they enroll. And people sometimes say, well, private schools can kick kids out. Well, they generally don't. I've seen studies which show that there are higher suspension rates in public schools than in, than in private schools. We have to recognize that there are many schools, private schools in the state of Minnesota, generally Catholic or Lutheran or Christian or non-denominational, non-religious, that would be happy to have many more kids. And to the question if you have vouchers, and you notice I haven't used that word, you can write a law that says if a school is going to accept voucher kids, they have to accept all kids, first come, first serve. And if they don't do that, then the vouchers wouldn't apply at that school. So that is, that is fixable. I'll just add one point that, um, you know, one of the things that I think is missed is that option, parents have options for public and private schools, should have those options, and sometimes the public option is the better option. And that's, you know, really about making the decision and about looking at all the data and information. Um, one of the things that uh, I sort of started, you know, people started approaching me and asking me, what do you think of this school? What do you think of that school? Where do you live? Let's look at the data. And a lot of times I recommend the public school option because it is probably the best option for their child. So I think what we have to recognize in the choice area is that it's about all options, not just about one option. And I'll just add to Mitch, it very eloquently talked about private schools. And, you know, there's, there are a lot of wonderful private schools across the state that are serving low-income students. They'd love to serve more, but they just financially cannot do so. Um, some great examples are Ascension uh, School in Minneapolis serving mostly low-income African-American students. Um, they do amazing work, have amazing uh, achievement rates in the school, really closing, beating the odds. Um, another example is Risen Christ with Latino students. Again, the same story. Um, I met one parent at Risen Christ that drives from Brooklyn Park to Risen Christ because of the quality of the education uh, her child receives there. So I think it's we have to think of choice in the whole wide spectrum, um, public, charter, privates. Um, they all have a market. They all serve students. Um, we need to have one strong system in order to um, to make sure that, that we have a strong education system. We have a question. Uh, Mitch and Sarah, why do only 47% of the kids on the north side of Minneapolis graduate from high school? And why isn't vocational training offered as a solution? <coughs> That's a Sarah question. I'll come out. I'll, I'll deal with it as well. So, well, I think that's a really big and lofty question, and I do think some of it has to do with exogenous factors that are influencing education performance, but I also think that, um, I mean, there's just a recent article in The Atlantic talking about the reality is our public schools have become, and our residential patterns have, are more segregated in Minnesota than they ever have been. So we are concentrating um, low economics, 
um, also other social factors that can hinder educational performance into particular neighborhoods and areas. And one of the things that, that makes me open to choice is the fact that we have clearly not solved the segregation problem, and over 200 jurisdictions are still under federal desegregation orders, but it's actually getting worse. And while, you know, as a person of color, I deeply support desegregation, but one of the avenues to that is letting parents, in my opinion, choose which school environment is best for them. And I think sometimes that environment um, involves small schools, sometimes it's a larger school, but it's too easy to get lost right now when you're already facing numerous um, social and environmental factors. The other half of the answer is that clearly lots and lots of kids on the north side and not just there, throughout this community, throughout this country, are growing up in really tough situations without their fathers, flat out. It's tough to hear, tough to say, most people won't talk about it, but it is true, it's a major Back to family fragmentation is a major problem. Having said that, on the policy side, what do we do to help overcome some of the disadvantages that those kids in particular face? And that's where I come back again to private schools, religious schools. The term I use, or the way I frame this is, for kids who may have holes in their hearts where their daddy should be, or where their mommy should be, or sometimes where both should be, just might be a school that is religiously animated. One more time, it's not going to work for everybody, it's going to work for some. So we have to indeed recognize what's going on outside of the schools. Generally when people cite that, they'll talk about poverty and all that, they won't talk about family fragmentation, but we have to. But we have that problem. What do we do in terms of policy to lessen that problem? I think we need more school choice that includes private schools. Well, the second part of my question was why don't we offer oh. vocational training? I, I uh, well, pass it along. This is something I'm working on right now. Um, over a number of decades, first of all, vocational programs often weren't very good. And they were used to track minority students into vocational tracks, not academic tracks. That was not right. It was an impossible situation to sustain, both morally and politically. There is now a growing recognition, again, that we have to have more vocational type education, not necessarily in K-12, but subsequent. And that's precisely the project that I'm working on now. What are alternative ways for people and not just low-income people, and not just people of color, to have a good career without necessarily getting a four-year college degree, a degree that they may not really want. They're being pressed by, let's say, they think their parents want them to go. They wind up in college, they don't do well, they come out with a lot of debt. What are the alternative routes, such as apprenticeships, such as certificate programs in community colleges and for-profit schools, such as the military, to help those young people become adults with good careers. One more time though, if we construct these programs in such a way as to have disproportionate numbers of low income and minority kids, the accusation can be made again that we are tracking. It's a very difficult balance to, uh, to reach. <laughs> Um, I work for Minneapolis Public Schools now. I've been there now for a year and a half. Uh, North Minneapolis is also going to have um, an educational tourist center. We're going to open it up uh, September 16th. And uh, in this center, we will have students who have not finished high school as a campaign called We Want You There. And we will have certificates for employment. We're going to start with three. We're going to open the doors for 80 students. We can have up to 200, but we're going to start small. And this is a partnership, uh, especially to address the issues that you are talking uh, with not graduating students in the area of North Minneapolis. Um, my title at Minneapolis Public School, I am the education, um, the deputy education officer, and I was charged with opening this center, which would open again September 16th of this year. Thank you.
So you're, you're satisfied with this graduation rate? No. It's equivalent to Mississippi? I'm not satisfied with the graduation rate in Indianapolis public school. I've been, there, I've been there for a year and a half. I'm going to be on a panel, and I'm going to tell you how we are increasing that graduation rate. Okay, one more question. Um, um, one of the things that we emphasize a lot is charter schools in Minnesota, and I'm looking for the success areas. Where can we look at things of success, like and she said, in Sleepy Eye and one of the schools? How are the charter schools doing in identifying some of these issues that way? Uh, the short answer is mixed. If you took a look at the uh, results of the MCATs the other day, uh, some of the schools that were doing the very best were chartered. Some of the schools that were doing the very worst were chartered. Uh, by definition, one will get different results in different charter schools. Is it a good idea that we have charters? Absolutely, yes. Is it really a good idea that Minnesota was the first in the nation? Yes, we were the first in the nation on any number of kinds of choice historically. Post-secondary enrollment options, inter-district choice, intra-district choice, charter schools, tax credits. We used to lead the nation. We used to be the locomotive. We're in the caboose now. We have to move forward on the train. Um. I was just going to say very quickly in response to the vocational training is that Summit OIC run by Lewis King actually does quite a bit of this on the north side and does it remarkably well. But I just also wanted to acknowledge that much of the problem has to do with the fact that the people who are coming to school don't have GED. So before they can really even obtain a job to begin the vocational training because of the low graduation rate, they first need to get a GED program. And I think in the next year or two, you're going to see a much bigger um, at least Twin Cities wide push to actually get more people to obtain their GED so they can move on to vocational training. And I do just want to briefly respond to the comment about DFL and the labor unions. And I'll say I am a labor union Democrat, but I don't think that, um, and I'm here talking about education reform and advocate for it, and certainly that creates difficult conversations at times. But the reality is someone has to make that effort and stop demonizing the other side. It's just not a productive way because we need to come at this from the students' outcomes first rather than on the back end. And we're talking it from a political perspective rather than a student outcome perspective right now. Okay, we're going to have uh, two more questions. We've got one, uh, Nancy here, and then Tony. I'm going to go on Thank you, Rick. Um, I wasn't surprised to to see the uh, response about choice in the survey because we have had choice for a long time. And you just nicely listed all of those examples that Minnesota has led in. My question for you is what your thoughts are in regard to the uh, desegregation lawsuit, the Guzman lawsuit that's been filed against the state of Minnesota. With choice being named as one of the factors that appears to be segregating schools. We have both white flight and we have uh, groups that will uh, choose to be uh, with, you know, Latinos will choose schools where there's a high concentration of Latinos and so on. So I'm just wondering where you think that conversation on that lawsuit fits in with your agenda for school choice. Thank you. I'll let Chaz take this because I know she's, or Mitch, I don't know if she's, but so, um, I mean, my opinion is that, first of all, to me it's a sign of desperation of students of color and their parents, is the fact that they're to the point where they have to sue, and that's what's most remarkable about it. Remarkable about it. But, and I also, I guess I choose to believe, I clearly believe that there is still racism and that there's a lot of influence of bias and decision making in all regards of institutions. But I also think that there's a big difference when some parent is making a choice to come to a certain environment. And I kind of choose to believe that most parents are deciding not based on racial factors, but are in fact based on the school performance factors. There is a very big difference between policies, laws, rules that push people by race and ethnicity in certain schools and they may not want to be there, and that's segregation. A difference between that and people freely choosing where they want to send their kids to school. Am I thrilled that so many schools are overwhelmingly this or overwhelmingly that? No, but people are making the choice. They have the freedom to make the choice. And I would add, 
when there are private schools in the mix, when there are choice programs and private schools are in the mix, private schools wind up generally more integrated than the public schools. The other point, finishing off here with the current lawsuit, it would be a disaster if this led to the demise, in many real ways, of charter schools. People have the right to send their kids where they want to send them, and this lawsuit, it seems to me, is leading in the absolutely opposite direction. One more question. Hey, since I'm uh, required to ask a question, I'll do that first and have a couple of comments if possible. First of all, does anyone here know that the explosion of uh, private schools happened? Are you talking about the private school academies in the South after? Just private know? schools. Yeah. I'm sorry? Private schools. When was the explosion of private schools? What do you mean the explosion? When more private schools all of a sudden came into being versus you know, the, it was mainly public schools. Do you know when that happened? Well, one answer, one answer would be early in the 20th century when uh, Catholics came to the United States and they weren't being treated, their kids weren't being treated very well in public schools, hence the creation of a lot of Catholic schools. So, is that the answer you're looking for? What answer are you well, about the answer? Is, the answer really is when desegregation, when the schools were forced to desegregate, that's when a lot of private schools popped up uh, around the country, and a lot of the tax base in the public schools went walking out the door. And you know, the the big issue in this country is unfortunately our zip code really does, uh, determines what quality of education or the services, let me say that, services of education that you may have. You know, you talked about the intensity of the uh, white community. If I'm going to a school in Edina, Eden Prairie, or Maine, or Suburb, and I've got these beautiful campuses, we all have computers and all the services, now my intensity is not going to be there versus if my kid goes to when Homecroft was open and there was like one computer uh, at that school because of our zip code and things. Um, you mentioned that the um, meeting two, you know, parents and a family and uh, two mother and a father, which is great, I agree with that, but the African American family has been split since the time of slavery, that the father was split away from the, um, you know, from the rest of the family, and it wasn't so much about because it was split, it was because not only did the mother raise that child and the one parent, but the whole community helped raise that child. And I do a lot of work in the schools uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and a big issue that we have now is that there isn't that parent involvement, and now, uh, not only that, but the um, parents these days <laughs> aren't really letting the teachers or the administrators and other people do their work because if their child acts out, the teachers know starting in, the kids know starting in second grade that the teachers do not have anything that they can really do about that because the parents are going to come running over there and uh, yell at the principal and the principal is going to yell at the teacher. So um, there's a whole host of things that need to be addressed, um, including making sure all of the schools are equal and not that your zip code determines how well your public school or private school is going to be. If I write just one quick sentence, and I look forward to talking to you afterwards, there's a lot yeah. in there, and I know we have to break. One of the aims, one of the virtues, very large aim, very large virtue, but the kind of choice we're talking about, is that parents should not be limited by the zip code in which they live. They should be able to send their kids elsewhere, publicly or privately, if they so choose. Well, uh, uh, could I, um, uh, before we start, just uh, we, we need to go on break. We want to stay on schedule. Here, now, here's what we'll be doing. I know, I know there's some questions here. At the end of our uh, third panel, we're going to be about, about 20 minutes for Q&A again. So if you have a question, hold on to it. I want to be fair to our next panel so we can stay on schedule. So with that, let's have a hand for our panel.